Hello, everybody. <laughs> I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this fun fellowship Friday night for the Church of the Eternally Secure, also known as CES. And we've been having fun even, even without the audience. We started having fun prematurely, a premature fun event. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I usually just end up amusing myself, but uh, we've got Sister Angel, uh, uh, Brother Steve. I almost called you Sister Steve there, uh, and Brother Ben. We're expecting Sister Lisa uh, in a bit. So hello to the congregation. Let's give them a greeting, and let's start with Sister Angel. All right. Hey, guys. Um it is really good to be back. I think this is the first time. Well, yeah, I did. A, I'll be doing three streams this week, so I uh, feel like I'm uh, keeping busy. Hope I can uh, keep up with it. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm hoping that Steve will uh, will uh, quote unquote wreck the place tonight by submitting one of his questions. But we'll see uh, if we if that's uh, in the cards for tonight. But uh, good to good to be here. Hope Sister Lisa uh, comes quickly and uh all right i'll uh turn it over to who steve hello wow i wasn't <laughs> asked a question about how to greet people tonight so i actually have free reign no 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 <laughs> no angel angels angel judge is the protocols oh no I'm looking forward I to. Uh, I, I need one of your good evenings. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's back up. Pretend. Pretend. Did <laughs> not, not disrupt the protocol. And I will say to Steve, "Okay, let's hear from Brother Steve. Do you have a greeting, for <laughs> brother?" Uh, uh, in fact, I, I do. Good evening, chat room and fellow brethren and sisters on the panel. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing quite well. Glad to be here. Glad you all are here with me. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, uh, you sound like a stuffed cat. Is that a stuffed cat? Like you have the top hat on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I even have the feather in in the top hat. Yeah. And the cane. Don't You, you, you cannot forget the cane. Or and, the white gloves. You and better... the penny in the loaf. You you better be smoking a pipe now. But of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, getting off to a good start. Oh no, I was just going to say hi to Lisa, and she disappeared on us. But we know that's part of her routine. She comes and goes at least once. There she is. Let's test it now. Lisa, let's see if your sound's working. Yep. Apparently not. Okay, let's move on to, to Brother Ben. Ben, give a greeting to the congregation, please. Uh, well, I dare not top hat, Steve. Um, but, uh, yes, it's good to be here. I'm looking forward to the uh, fellowship, and we have a good set of questions. And, uh, Steve, uh, go ahead and shut it down if you need to. That, that's, I mean, that's the opposite of what it actually means. Oh, good. I'm glad it's the opposite because I don't really want to hear the other, the other uh, kind of response. We've we've had a few kind of near shutdowns uh, in the past, and uh, we don't want any more of that if I if we can help it. Um, all right, let's uh, Sister Lisa. Oh, she's there. She's she's certainly there now. There's two of her. Hello, Lisa. <laughs> okay. All right, Lisa, if you're listening, just speak up if you're able to whenever you're ready. Let me see. Who did? Who has not said hello? I think everybody's given a greeting, right? Okay, let's look at the chat room and see who's in there. Okay, all of the usual suspects. Yeah. Uh, hello to everybody. Um, now, if you're one of the regular uh, participants in the chat room, then we... We call you the chat room, the congregation. Welcome back. Uh, if you're here for the first time, let's make sure we recognize people who are new and, and uh, give them a good friendly welcome. So uh, I hope that you have a good time with us tonight and maybe you'll want to re return. We not only have this Friday night program, but uh, a Wednesday night Bible study and a Sunday church service 
along with uh, assorted uh, programs from affiliated channels. Uh, last night was an excellent program put on by Brother Steve. Uh, if you didn't see that, I ho hope everybody will go and listen to that. It's quite a long uh, discussion, but uh, there's not one moment that's boring. It's very interesting. Um, all right. Uh, anybody have any opening remarks here? Anything that needs to be said before we get into the business matter of answering the true-false statements? Okay. Let, let's do that then. Brother Ben, what's the first uh, first true-false? Okay. The true first true-false is true or false. Uh, Rahab in Joshua 6 is a type dash shadow. So Rahab in Joshua 6 serves in scripture as a type or shadow, true or false. And if so, obviously, what, what would that shadow or type be of? Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't, I didn't write that question, so I shouldn't be going last, but I'm certainly, I'm eager to go last. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wrote it. I okay, wrote it. all right, you got me. So you go last and I'll go next to last. Let's start off with Brother Ben. Me? Oh, okay. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. Ben has a negative answer. No, 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 no. Don't, don't do that to me. Yes. <laughs> because I, I apologize. I, I wanted to study this. Um, I wanted to scrutinize this because uh, I'm sure it's loaded with gems. Uh, but I didn't really get a chance to. Um, but what I'll share. Your Galatians tie in. Well, yes, that's true. Um, it, yes, that's true. But uh, it doesn't pertain to Rahab per se. Well, I, right. I'll give you a little bit. Of, I'll give you a little background real quick. With Joshua six yes. and seven, um, I wanted. I, I saw the word anathema used repeatedly. It's a Greek word, anathema. It's used repeatedly in the uh, New Testament. It's used. Uh, Paul says, "I wish I was anathema from Christ uh, for the sake of my brethren." Uh, he says, "Anyone treat, teaches a false gospel, uh, let him or let him or the angel be an anathema." Uh, if someone does not love the Lord. Uh, it says in Corinth, First Corinthians or Second Corinthians that that person should be anathema, and I I knew that I know I just knowing the character of God that there's no way he would leave, I uh, could do because the range of meanings that people would suggest for that word were all over the place, like you know from doomed to hell uh, to um, to you know being excommunicated, uh, all, all kinds of range of meanings, and I knew that God would not leave us victim. To man's uh, conjectures about what that word meant, um, and, and I did actually consult some uh, some Greek sources, and they uh, did actually say that um, the word anathema just means um, it means set up in a part or up and away, and um, and so that was interesting. And what's interesting, uh, by the way, too, this is how the I don't know this is how God works with me because I was really you knew I was troubled by that word, and that. Uh, I did. I wouldn't get 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 any rest until I had an answer. And so uh, the whole time he's showing me what it meant. And, and, and what reason I, I say this? And don't read too much into this, but I think this is interesting. So so people are probably going to use this against me, but whatever. Um, I kept when I was I kept on seeing an ad, a Cheetos ad. It was a mother who who took who trapped her children in a net, and then she'd hoist it up like you would in, when you camp. Like I don't know if you if you I would camping in the Rocky Mountains. And we had to do that to keep the bears away from our food. We had to hoist our food up into a net and then hoist it up uh, high in the air on a pole so they couldn't get to it. So it means to set up and away so it couldn't touch the ground, essentially. And um, and so, again, I kept seeing this ad for Cheetos that had that, which, which is really weird because I never see that anywhere. Um, but anyways, uh, again, that was t that's that's here, near, neither here nor there, really. But the... The word I, I wanted to know what it meant, so uh, I read. I, it was I, I thought, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get it from understand it from Galatians six, and Galatians six basically uh, would say was talking about um, well, what they got, so I, again the Greek resources I read said that uh, anathema was used in, in Greek secular sources to mean a military detachment or a province of a state, so like a separate part. So it's not it just means like a a, a piece broken apart essentially from the whole from the main part essentially so it doesn't necessarily have a good or bad connotation in and of itself the context determines if it's a good or bad connotation if it's broken apart for good or broken away for for bad so uh with that in mind um I, again the thing in galatians it was saying that um in galatians it said you know if anyone teaches a false gospel let it be anathema and i started reading about uh you know it talked about these judaizers who were coming in for the galatians and teaching them to uh that they need to keep the law 
they didn't care about uh they didn't really just care about um whether they believed in Christ necessarily, but they wanted to be circumcised and uh and so again Paul said if, if I wasn't preaching circumcision, uh they wouldn't uh, have a problem. But they again it, it, it almost seems like Satan knew exactly what to do. That I think he just introduced one law to them um that would uh essentially uh, break them uh the the spirit the god's the holy spirit's supernatural p power source that he provides they would be they would be alienated from that if they were trying to please god through the law and i think i believe that's what galatians is teaching and so i started starting this word and i looked at, i found that the old testament had a word similar to it there's a hebrew word similar to anathema it actually has two forms i mean kerem or karem and I, I found, I started looking at that word and it, it's all over Joshua. And um, one thing that's interesting in Joshua, this is Joshua 6 and 7. I'll go into rehab in a second. But uh, Joshua 6 and 7, God basically says, okay, I'm going to give you the land, but uh, uh, you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to partake of the anathema or the karem, the thing that God's excluded. You're not supposed to take, partake of that. If you do, I will no longer be with you. In other words, he's not going to fight your, their battles with them anymore. And so a guy named uh, Achan, uh, his family, or he, uh, found some Babylonian armor. Again, I see it as a picture of the law because the law tries to make you, um, you, you – people want to keep the law to stand out. They, they make themselves feel special, or it's also an armor. Like they think it's, they think it's protecting them somehow, they're, they're, that, that their keeping of the law is going to somehow justify them before a holy God when it's, 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 it's absolutely false. But anyways, Achan took his, uh, this armor that was off limits. It's also a picture of the, uh, of the uh, tr tree of good and evil because it uses the same language where it says that Achan saw, desired, and took, just like Eve did. Anyways, he took this armor, and then the uh, Israelites started losing in battle. And God said, I, you know, I'm not going to be with you in battle. Uh, the reason you're losing in battle is because I'm not with you anymore. And unless you get rid of the anathema, uh, I, I, uh, again, I'm not going to be with you anymore. In fact, you'll be an anathema. Which means again, you'll be you'll be separate. You, instead of being uh, part of God's plan, essentially, you're going to be outside of His plan. You're going to be cast out as as something He's going to use uh, in terms of uh, being a witness for Him in the world. And um, and so, anyways, that, that I saw that, and and uh, it actually said that uh, the word He used is that uh, that there's someone who's troubled the camp. So when Achan took the armor, it troubled the camp. Well. That's the exact same word that that word troubled was the exact same thing that happened in Galatians where uh, uh, Paul said those who trouble you with these weak and beggarly things like this this armor you know that the, the the law is weak and beggarly especially when it can uh, you know, first of all it's earthly um, it, it pertains to earthly matters not spiritual things and so it's weak and beggarly compared to spiritual things and uh, and so that's what happened with the Galatians they they were troubled by a Judaizer who brought in the anathema. They, they accepted the anathema, the thing that should be excluded. The law, again, uh, it, it's, it, it, that has nothing to do with grace. In fact, that's why Paul said in Galatians, um, I do not set aside the grace of God. And I mentioned that last night where there's always parallelism in Scripture. Well, right in Galatians, I believe the bookend is, he says first that I am going to... Um, I, I I want you to set aside or, or consider anathema anyone who comes to you with a false gospel, and then he he says a bunch of things in a couple of chapters, and he kind of caps it off with for for I do not set aside the grace of God, and that's exactly what these Judaizers are doing. They're saying set aside the grace of God. Uh, you need to be justified by the law, and circumcision is a piece of that. That's the first step, essentially. So, anyways, all kinds of parallels in in Joshua six, seven, and eight with Galatians, um, and I think I to me I. I there's no way I would have discovered this on my own. I think the Lord led me to this uh, to understand this because He knew I needed to understand the word anathema. But anyways, with regards to Joshua six, um, that that is part of it. How I came to it, and what, what Joshua six starts off with is I do believe it again. It is kind of part of the whole understand the anathema because again, the, the whole Bible is about dividing, 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 cut, cut off, cut out. So there's all kinds of anathema, those kind of words. Um, you know, there's no fellowship with dark lightness and darkness. You see that all over the place. And you see that uh, in Joshua 6, I believe, starting with Joshua 6. And I see Joshua 6 as an end time scenario, essentially, because it says in the first sentence, Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. So right there, I see that as a picture of when Noah, uh, when God uh, shut the door 
uh, on Noah's Ark, that was the point of no return. It's like the end. It was the end of that. That was a final judgment for that that ancient world. There was no more. Your time to get on the ark was over, essentially. And uh, Jericho is kind of a picture, I believe, of the end times when um, when there's the point of no return. You you had your chance to believe, and you will not believe. Uh, and then that's why it says in Revelation, for example, that these people were um, they 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 said hide us from the face of the Lamb of God. Well, you know what. We, that's like just madness because why wouldn't you uh, turn and, and believe on the lamb and be saved? But they became so stupid, and I think that's what sin does. It warps the intellect, and uh, they, they they said couldn't even think straight, and they would just try to hide from the lamb of God even though they knew who he was. Um, and, uh, it, and that's exactly what happened in Jericho where, they, where Rahab said, uh, we heard about these uh, – what, you, what what God has done for you to the Egyptians and all these enemies along the way, how he's delivered you. And that they were so scared they couldn't even move. I think it said their knees were like water or something. And again, I thought, okay, well, again, why? If you knew that was the case, you saw these people marching around the city. Why wouldn't you? I personally, I would want to leap out and throw my, you know, throw myself face down and, and beg for mercy. But these people couldn't. I, I think again, they were just frozen with fear. It was a point of no return. And God did say He would make them uh, supernaturally make them uh, fearful. So that I think they were supernaturally hardened at that point. Um, Anyways, with, with Rahab, I, I see her as a picture of a Gentile believer who will believe. Again, the spies went to her. She wasn't seeking them. God, the spies uh, went to her, and she responded uh, favorably to them, just like you know, it's like we they just like we receive, we receive and respond favorably to the gospel. Um, and what's interesting, another thing about that the uh, when, it, when uh, they said lay out the red thread. I know I've been going on for a long time, so I'm going to cut myself short. Um, when they said lay out the red thread. One thing that's interesting that word for red thread is the same word I think is used in one of the Psalms of talking about Jesus, where he says, "I am not a man; I'm a worm." So that red thread, that red worm, is the same word. I think that's fascinating. It's again, it's a picture of Christ, obviously the, the atoning sacrifice, and that's why you know they saw that red thread and she was um uh not destroyed and in fact um people have done uh studies on that jericho there they could find that wall and that that that's there's still an area of the wall that's still standing to this day and they do believe that uh there's a very strong case that can be made that was rahab's uh headquarters or uh quarters so that's that's really interesting mm -hmm. sorry if i went too long mm -hmm. yeah you uh uh you said you were going to cut yourself short, but when you said that, you were already too late. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I thought it was very interesting, though. But it was, keep in mind, there's six of us or five of us. So, all right. Uh, let me see. Uh, Lisa, we haven't uh, heard from you It's my fault because I, I wanted him to, to go Sister into the Lisa, uh, We haven't heard from you yet. Could we test your audio and see if it works? Hi, can you guys hear me okay? Oh, yeah, we hear you good. Uh, welcome, sister. So you have to do two things. We have a true-false uh, statement for you to talk about, and we also need a greeting from for the congregation. Praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. I'm very glad to be with you all this evening. had a little, little technical issues where my audio wasn't connecting, but I have rebo rebooted a couple of times and finally got that corrected, so... Thank you very much for your patience. Apologies for my tardiness. Uh, I didn't get to hear the question. I saw it and I went on and answered it as undecided because I would have to reread <laughs> Joshua 6 and 7 to refamiliarize my, myself with the passage. So I missed the overview on what the passage was talking about. I heard somewhat of uh, what Ben was saying. I didn't hear anybody else's answer if anybody else did answer. Yeah. Well, Ben went first. So why don't we, we do this? Uh, I'll, I'll okay. So uh, later, uh, after you've heard other people uh, answer and uh, give you more time to think about it and, and okay. hear your answers. Okay, uh, let's uh, see. Let's see. We had uh, Ben uh, and now Steve. Steve, now don't don't follow Ben's lead here. Remember, you know, there's there's five on the panel. So, okay, Steve. <laughs> we are all long-winded speakers generally um oh boy you, you had to make me go second after after that okay um so to give some the the question is is rahab a shadow 
um, a shadow of what uh, would be my my question, but I am guessing it is a, it is it, does it shadow uh, in some way, shape, or form? Uh, is it a shadow or type of Christ Rahab's story? Not you know I I would say that uh, Rahab herself um, is is not the uh is not a shadow of christ but is a shadow it is a shadow of uh of what christ would do in saving us for uh the in in joshua 2 um this is just amazing to me it says this is this is uh, Rahab speaking to the two spies that Joshua sent in, uh, and she said unto the men, "I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you." For we have heard how the Lord dried up the. For we have heard. Hmm. What were we talking about last night about hearing things? Hmm. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. When ye came out of Egypt and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. As soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord, your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. That That is just amazing. They heard. So someone, someone said something to someone who said something to someone who said something to someone, obviously in some way, shape or form, they were, whether, you know, you want to call it witnessing or uh, spreading the gospel, etc. They heard. And in some was the savor of life and in some was the savor of death as the new testament tells us as paul writes it that way so there's that there's also the fact that there's two spies sent in uh and and there's two witnesses in revelation and the fact that uh the, the other part of this and what ben was touching on um, I won't go into detail there as much, but uh, that that uh, everything that was not to be saved through faith of Rahab or anyone else that was that was what you know. Uh, that that was why she was saved was because of faith. She was the only one that and her house that was uh that was receipt that received the spies and, and hid them. But uh so there's that and th that is an interesting correlation that I think about when Paul talks about marriage, that if you stay married to your spouse, you and your children will be saved. Now, some people look at it. I don't know which is which is true, but I'm going with there's a possible correlation there that Rahab believed hid the spies her and her house was saved all those in her house were saved so that is a correlation there as well um, the other thing is the reason one of the biggest reasons for the fact that everything was to be destroyed and not kept was because this was God's battle. That's why God had him march around the thing seven times. 
and praise God for the victory. That's why they were to shout and was to shout in praise of what God would do because God was taking the victory over what was sin in the earth. If anyone was to keep part of that for themselves, they were taking what belonged to God and his glory. They were, they were, they were in effect trying to say they had something to do with the battle or claim something out of it that was not theirs. That's why it's an anathema because it doesn't belong to them. The battle belonged to the Lord. The other thing is that, <clears throat> isn't it interesting that uh, this along with the Red Sea, the, the Red Sea that, parted that she's talking about where the Israelites came through the Red Sea that God parted. They, they were in effect being, uh, God was showing us there the, the physical of being dead, buried and rising again, being washed anew through the Red Sea, through his blood. Uh, that's another shadow, but she's, Rahab is talking about that along with the other conquests that God had done in and through his people. That's another thing with, with what our faith shows people that we were talking about last night. So, uh, but I wanted to point out that and Moses's, the, the red blood on the doorpost that the death angel passed over. And now here again in this story, you have Rahab was told to put out a red uh, piece of, of, of cloth or line, something like that. I don't know the exact words, but a red piece of, of, of cloth out of their window. And that would be, let them know who was to be saved. Why red? Because that's a picture of the blood of Christ that we <coughs> believe has covered our sins. The rest of the camp was utterly destroyed because they were not covered in the blood. They were not trusting in the the people of God and, and their message, which was to to you know to trust God and and through that uh, act of faith she was she was saved, um, her and her house. So there's a lot there, and the other most unique thing that I think is often left out of this is that because of that. Rahab became part of the lineage of Christ, which is just amazing that God would choose a whore to be a part of his lineage. That's what harlot means, a prostitute. <clears throat> so with that in mind, God chooses the sinner to save and God can do anything with anyone who is willing to be used by him, no matter what you've done, God can save you. And so if Jesus can choose a prostitute to be a part of his lineage, to bring salvation to the world, certainly he will save you if you trust in him. Okay. I think you had a period there, but I never know if you're done or not, brother. <laughs> you're all finished? Hey, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, let, me, let me go next. Um, hey, Luke. Um, yeah. Steve kind of he finished up on kind of a point that would really flow seamlessly into what I was going to say, and you said you wanted to go last. Anyway, no, so I, no, I I'm, I'm going to let me go and then Elisa and then you go last since you asked, asked, asked the question. Is that right? Okay. 
Okay. Uh, my turn won't take very long. But first, let me say that I, I really uh, enjoyed listening to that. Also, I, Ben, I did enjoy listening to it uh, very much. Uh, I think both both of you made a lot of outstanding points. Uh, my only point, and when I say, have to say these things, I'm, you know, I have to be the bad guy because I, I feel that one of my top responsibilities hosting the program especially when you have five or six people participating is to try to keep it moving so that everybody's involved and that means that uh, when you have this many people we have to keep the answers a little bit shorter uh, and and so everybody gets a turn and, and try to make sure everybody's getting equal time i am kind of preoccupied with that as a responsibility so but uh, as far as the content uh, of what ben said and steve said it was just a lot of really outstanding points uh, I, I actually learned a lot I'm glad that I uh, uh, heard them, but um, I have a playlist titled um, The Bloody Trail, Pictures and Shadows of Jesus' Blood Atonement. And um, I'm going to talk just for a moment about uh, pictures and shadows because um, I, I know that every time we get together, we have a mixed audience. Uh, some people here are very learned in the scriptures uh, in the chat room some of you you're certainly qualified to be here on the panel and uh, as as much as any of us uh, and, and and then we have other people here joining us uh maybe they're uh either uh newcomers to the, the bible or recently got saved they're just beginning their studies uh uh or maybe some people here listening now are, are you're not even saved and uh, hopefully you'll you'll learn the gospel and believe it, and that would be wonderful. But uh, realizing that we have a different uh, a mix of audience, sometimes we got to back up and say, wait, are, are we being a little advanced here, talking over people's heads sometimes? And that means we got to uh, hey, define terms at least so they, they understand what, we're, what the words mean. And pictures and shadows is something we take for granted that everybody knows what that is. But... There's many things that happened uh, throughout the Bible that um, are um, they, they're called pictures and shadows because what is a shadow? A, a shadow is a is an image of let's say there's a shadow of me uh, on the floor. Uh, well, it looks like me to a certain extent, but the details are not there, uh, just the outline. Uh, and so. Uh, in the Bible, the pictures and shadows is there's there's some kind of a message that is not real clear, but it does have a, a meaning and a significance about something that in the future that is going to be very clear. And and what we're talking about is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus uh, as uh, to save the world. Uh, now I'm not going to try to go through any of the pictures and shadows that I put on our playlist. But we probably had 10 or 15 that we discussed, and there's many more. As, as I said tonight, I'm seeing that there are some, definitely some pictures and shadows with the Rahab account. Um, but I also agree with Lisa's initial point that uh, for me, uh, uh, I, I read the Bible uh, numerous times, uh, and then after reading it over and over again, I, I started focusing more on topical studies over the years. So I find a subject uh, and then uh, try to dig in and really understand a, a topic. I've also done a lot of character studies about individuals, uh, important individuals in the Bible. But as far as studying the, the book of Joshua and the Rahab account, uh, uh, I would have to go back and really read it again and really contemplate it to be able to answer this question very well. Uh, I, I do think that so far what's been said has been very interesting and enlightening. So let's let's now move to uh, Lisa, and then we'll get the angel's answer since she she asked the question. Okay, well, I quickly reread the passages, and then the question was, was this a foreshadow? Um, I guess of things to to come, and I would say uh, yes, concerning the judgment of the Lord. Um, I keep telling people God ain't playing, and the same God that was God in the old covenant is the same God that's the God in the new covenant. And there, there, there's a period of grace, and then there's a time when 
even though God is love, there is going to be judgment. And I think this would definitely be an example of that, as as well as, uh, you know, I, tell, I keep pointing, you could correlate this right there with Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, God is not to be played with. And he showed that right there in the new covenant when you get to them. <laughs> so um, when I come and I start preaching hard and I tell people, if y'all messing with a curse things, you need to leave those things alone. The Lord been warning you and warning you and warning you. Paul said, there is a sin unto death. I do not say that we should pray for it. He said, I don't even say we should pray for it. And, you know, it seems like every time I try, you know, when I be visiting with people and I start preaching on that, some kind of way I get shut down. But that's that's okay. I'll do a sermon on it eventually. <laughs> but um, listen, the Lord is real and he's not playing it. Yes, he is love and yes, he is grace and yes, he is mercy. But there is a time when he says, now, I done told you to stop. And when he do, when he comes at you like that, you better stop. <laughs> I don't know what else to tell you. all But, yes, it is a it is a foreshadow. It's a foreshadow of his judgment and that he's not playing. You see what he did to him, his family and everything. He said, uh, uh-uh. he didn't he didn't then have mercy, even though he confessed his sin. The judgment was declared and he had to carry out the judgment that was declared. And that's the same thing that's going to happen in the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. The judgment that has been declared is coming. So these are not fun topics to discuss, but they true. Anyhow, he is the Lord. So that's, you know, Paul, was it Paul? I get him mixed up where the scripture says, uh, some say with compassion, others say with fear, making a difference. There's a time to preach about the judgment of the Lord. There is a time for those type of sermons because the world has no fear of God before their eyes. And he is literally going to pour, pour out his wrath. The Bible talks about it being his wrath. When he's pouring out his wrath that, you know, it, he's demonstrating who he is, that he is the Lord. He is not to be played with. And he has given people a span to repent for what? Uh, well, first of all, from the beginning, but also since Christ, the repentance is to change their mind and believe on him and throw themselves upon his mercy. And they have rejected his son. And there's a point where they just I told you there's a scripture right there in Revelation where it says he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is just, let him be just still and righteous. And in other words, he's coming to judge you where you at. There is a time that that he's going to roll this thing up. And move into, sorry for people who don't believe in dispensations, (laughs) move into another dispensation. And we're going to see his millennial reign and the devil cast into the bottomless pit. And this is all as a witness, not only to humanity, but to the fallen ones that accuse God of being unjust because he wouldn't forgive them. (laughs) So, you know, there's a whole lot that's tied up in this. It's not just about what transpired there. Yes, and he had mercy on on the harlot because uh, she received the spy. She saw the glory of God. And I'm going to just paraphrase, keep this real simple. I don't want to go on too long. When she saw them, the glory of God being upon them, that they were the righteous men, that they were different. There was something different. That's why she received them. And what one could equate was essentially what? Betray her own people. Well, why? Well, (laughs) if you see the world is going down and it's about to burn and you see a way out, only a fool wouldn't take it. So she saw a way out. And that way was the way of salvation. So there's another type of that in there. So, you know, I, I love when we go back. You, if you don't want to get in trouble in the old covenant, you need to, to try to correlate it with the new covenant. Or you, you can fall into some things that really do lead people astray. And they put the focus and emphasis in the wrong place. And, and then resort back to legalism. It is the grace of Christ. And grace is, grace is wrought through Christ. But there is judgment coming. And we should warn the world. Yes, we should. Because they're not, they're not on the Lord's side. You know, we see that over and over again. Who is on the Lord's side? And they have to make a decision. <laughs> and choose Christ. 
and and he has made every way available as possible to make it as simplistic. And that's why I say people who are working against the true simplicity of the gospel are act agents of the devil, whether they realize it or not. They are emissaries of the devil because he has made it so simple that a little child can understand. And if and if you can't hear a message and understand it with that level of simplicity, something's not right. It's not supposed to be that difficult. So on, on that, I'm just gonna shut up. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> all right, thank you. Awesome. Uh, amen to everything you said, sister. Uh, uh, I guess that uh, encourages me to uh, repeat in case people didn't hear me earlier that uh, uh, on Brother Stevens' channel last night, they had a really good uh, discussion on the, the simple things uh, and uh, the, the simplicity that's in Christ. And the, what, for example, why do we have to uh, discuss what believe means? I mean, it, it seems to me that why is that necessary? And yet it's become necessary. Uh, just the, the simple idea of, of uh, defending the fact that uh, be believing just means to believe. And, uh, uh, so the program last night was was really very good, and uh, if you didn't see it, uh, Steve put the link in the chat room so you, so you can watch that. All right, everybody's answered except for the or originator of the question, Sister Angel. All right, so I'll try to try to keep it short here because um, everybody covered. There's, there's so much to go into with that whole chapter. Joshua is, uh, is amazing. I never really thought about it until. Recently, I was teaching it to my daughter. I was like, whoa, there's a lot in here. But um, so people pointed out a lot of really great points about Rahab. But I, I just found this is just one little thing. This is obviously, I don't think this is the most significant, um, you know, meaning behind Rahab at all. But it's something that was interesting to me because of the ways that um, the Bible always has. I feel like a lot of times when people identify a type or shadow of something in, in scripture, there's like actually like, so there's so many layers, they, they, all different directions. So we pointed out about Rahab being a, a shadow of, of what Christ would do, of, of salvation, you know, with the red string. But I also think it's interesting that she, you know, uh, she was a harlot. And the way I see her, uh, it, to me, she also represents, uh, I guess, what you could call Israel uh, as like, you know, in terms of the unbelieving Israel in a way, because through her, Christ, you know, comes through, uh, through God's people. That's how, that's how, you know, he was actually, what was actually special and set apart about Israel. Right. And so, and we know that she's actually in his lineage. Um, and the, I also see her as a shadow of the leaving Israel, the remnant, because of the way that, uh, like Lisa pointed out, uh, you know, I, I think, I, I think revelation points out that a lot of, a lot of them will, will, uh, will, will turn to Jesus, you know, literally in the last minute, once they see all of these uh, signs that unfold uh, in Revelation. Um, and I didn't actually think about that until she was talking about it. But if we think about uh, harlot Israel, uh, it's, it, you know, we see that she, Rahab was spared for she hid the, the messengers, right? Well, uh, Israel was throughout the Old Testament always getting... Uh, uh, chastised and and really just chewed out by God for for uh, you know going into not only just unbelief but just the di complete disobedience. They uh, you know were uh, very stiff necked and stubborn. They you know really like fr from the moment that God delivered them with, by parting the Red Sea, they were already going into uh, you know <laughs> uh, like pagan back into paganism and. And basically, they were never really on the course that God God wanted them to be. Um, and yet, uh, what was special about Israel was that you know not only through not only through Israel did Jesus Christ uh, come, but also the prophets, right? So um, when I saw that line, you know, uh, about her hiding the messengers, I can only think about how um, how Christ. Uh, well, okay, so Israel hid the. Uh, the progenitors of Jesus Christ, we know like the bloodline from David unto Mary. Um, it, that's, that's one of the aspects that I see represented by Rahab, especially, you know, of course she ends up dwelling in Israel until this very day. Right. And um, all of her house was saved, you know, 
do, do you see the parallels I'm talking about, like, you know, in reference to actually Israel in the Bible? Uh, I just find that, I just find that really interesting. There's that because of the fact that that was not the primary, uh, uh, purpose I feel of, of Rahab. I think she was also, you know, it, it was important the way that she was a shadow of salvation and of what Ben pointed out of the Gentiles believing. But I also see a shadow of, of, of Israel in Rahab, um, which I just think is really fascinating because he, God layers in as many uh, uh, incredible symbolic meanings as he can in so many different areas of scripture. So I knew that people probably were going to, to point out a million different ways of different things that she shadowed. Uh, and I figured people might not see this one, but I wanted to point out how how God will do that, like how there will be more than one thing and even uh, things that are almost contradictory, Gentile Israel, but you can see both things uh, in the story of Rahab. And I just thought that was interesting. So that's why I asked the question. But we can move on there now. I know last time that <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to be like the other week where we were on the first question for like two hours or <laughs> whatever. So. Yeah, you remember the backlash we got from the oh I know about that. So yeah, but what, <laughs> did you, uh, what, what did you think of the the answers uh, from uh, everybody? Was that helpful? Oh yes, uh, and I really loved how you know Ben pointed out that you know about the Gentiles, uh, how you know how she was a shadow of of the, the you know. The, the gospel going to the Gentiles and the Gentiles, you know, believing uh, rather, rather easily. It's funny because it seems like even with her story, it's like she, it, it was a lot easier to make her believe than a lot of, uh, a lot of Israel uh, throughout the entire old Testament. You know what I mean? Um, but, uh, but that's what I, I, and I figured people will go in that direction, which I think is accurate. And like I said, the primary purpose of, of her story, but I also see what I think is really clear Hence, that she also shadows something else, and we almost can't avoid that because we know she's in the lineage, and she ended up in Israel. So I think that that is just—it's amazing. Like only God could have written the Bible. You know what I mean? It's just too uh, intricate. All the different types and shadows. Uh, when I first started uh, studying, when I first got saved, I just—I couldn't believe it. I was floored. And these are things you never ever hear about or or realize as a, as a scoffer and an atheist. So. Amen. Oh, and they're screaming. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, all right. Before we move to the next question, is there anybody who wants to add more? Anyone? Okay. All right. Thank you. Brother Ben, what's the next question? Okay. Well, one thing I want to say real, just real quick, uh, Steve, you said that um, it. Uh, w w one thing I was kind of trying to find is a, a term I could replace for anathema, essentially. And I came with all kinds of things like set apart uh i have i have probably 20 different words i was trying to find but nothing really satisfied me but now uh you said the word belong that like it doesn't belong to you and i think that's almost as close as we get so uh that was a that was a gift of god <laughs> for, to me um okay so the next question is um the bible true, true or false the bible was authored by non-human malevolent beings I lose everyone. Luke, you muted. You muted. Muted, Luke. I'm sorry. Okay, where did that question come from? That came. That was inspired by some email I got. So, um, all right. So we don't, we don't have to make anybody go last. Then, uh, all right. Uh, who's eager? Who wants to go first on this one? All right. I'll, I'll go first uh, since there's nobody volunteering. Um, well, the thing that, that strikes me about the question is the word malevolent. Uh, uh, it, because of that, I would certainly say uh, 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 wrong, uh, it, uh, false. It's, uh, it's, it's inspired by non-human being, a being, uh, not beings. Uh, well, I, it could be argued beings or being because of the triunity of the Godhead, but uh, and, and uh, God is uh, non-human except for the humanity of Christ so there's all kinds of conflicting uh, ans conflictions conflictions <laughs> making up my own words uh, in the the question but uh, the, the, what really um, makes me have to say 
absolutely false is the word malevolent. Uh, unless you are a, a Manichaean uh, a Gnostic, which believes that um, there is two beings, um, they're equal, uh, God, a good God and an evil God, uh, that uh, the evil God is, um, what is his name? Someone here probably can think of the name of uh, the... the Demiurge. Um, yeah, Demiurge. Demiurge. Thank you, Dem Demiurge. Um, if, if you're in that school of thought, then you would uh, you you might be able to say true on this, but uh, I, I don't think any of us here <laughs> bought into that. Um, so uh, it's to me, it's clearly false uh, because God is not malevolent. Unless you're a Calvinist, then God's certainly malevolent because in Calvinism, um, God is the source and and, and author and and uh, uh, of all evil. In fact, God would be the only one that is evil in Calvinism because uh, the rest of us are just innocent puppets that God is using to uh, do evil. Even, even the fallen angels and Satan, they, they're innocent puppets in Calvinism uh, because God just forces everybody to sin. Uh, so um, in, in their view of God, that's why I cannot... Uh, and that's my biggest objection to Calvinism is that they make God evil. Um, that's not the God of the Bible. I also object to eternal torment for the same reason, because uh, I believe that makes God evil, but it's, uh, uh, I think it just, it goes against what I understand the, the character of God. But uh, so I, I say the answer to the question is uh, certainly false. Okay. So who wants to go second? I'll go second because I'm going to keep it short. Okay. Um, it, yeah, my answer was certainly false. Uh, in 2 Timothy 3.16 through 17, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Uh, so we, we know, and there's other scriptures too, you know, that talks about the law of the Lord and thy word is truth, for example, and others. Uh, so no, that's patently false on its face. And that whole, yeah, their marriage thing. Yeah, I looked into that. That's basically, that's Luciferianism. I don't know if people know, <laughs> realize that, but um, you're trying to make the God of the old covenant, the devil. And I, I even questioned somebody who teaches that. And I said, well, what do you do with the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ when he's the only one that can open the seals that pour out judgment? They didn't have an answer. So I'm like, yeah, yeah nice try, but it ain't going to work. I don't think it flies. But uh, in fact, I know it doesn't. I'm sure it doesn't. As far as annihilation, now you know, Brother Luke and I disagree on that. Because I don't see how it makes God evil when he has been warning people about the impending judgment that is coming and what the ultimate place will be when he's warned and warned and warned and warned and they've denied, 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 denied. He's not doing anything to them. They're doing it to themselves. So I, I, I disagree as far as that point he made that it makes God, even though it doesn't make God evil, he is who he is. And he has warned people and warned and warned and warned that this is what the ultimate is going to be, the lake of fire. And they have rejected, 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 rejected. That's not his fault. So that's the position I would take on that. But, um, yeah, this this whole concept that uh, the the old covenant God or, or the scripture is somehow uh, inspired by my <laughs> malevolent beings because you see things that are well just like the passage this actually kind of ties into what we were just uh looking at that's a serious harsh judgment that fell on the man to disobey the lord and and did what he wanted to do there there's a type right there of the world doing what you want to do do as thou will should be the whole of law i hear what god says i see what god said but i'm gonna do this anyway <laughs> and, and people think there's no judgment, but there's a day that's coming. The Bible is talking about this judgment. And he has warned and warned and warned and warned and warned. 
And I've come to believe when I read Romans, for example, Romans 1, and then most people stop there and they just talk about all the sin that's in Romans 1. They forget chapter 2, verse 1 that says, therefore, whenever the therefore is therefore there, you should find out what the therefore is there for. So you see chapter 1, all the sin mentioned and all these different things. The overarching sin for all of that is idolatry. All of it's the rejection of the Lord. Remember in the Gospel of John where it said men love darkness rather than light. And they won't come to the light because then their deeds would be reproved. That's exactly what's going on in Romans 1. But in chapter 2, uh, verse 1, where it says, Therefore, thou art without excuse, O man, whosoever thou art that judges, because in judging another, thou doest the same things. <laughs> so the very the, the, the only one that has the right as far as judgment goes to say that person is going to hell is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says all judgment. Not some, not most, not many. All judgment is reserved for the son. No wonder the old covenant says, kiss the son, lest he be angry. People run around kicking the son. Mm -mm, Y'all going to be in trouble for that. Kiss the son, lest he be angry. Because Jesus is the one that's judging everything. They used to have a song back in the day. It, 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 was like, it wasn't even like a whole song. It was just like people would say, here comes the judge, here comes the judge. Well, if you're going to stand before the judge, the judge of all things, you would think you would at least do one thing your whole life, even if you didn't honor everything he said or do anything he said. And that's not disrespect the judge. But these people speak against the Lord. They call him everything but a child of God. They, they curse his name, the whole thing. It's like y'all is fools and blind, just like the Bible says, fools and blind. If I'm going to go stand before the judge, even if I believed in the whole works-based thing, one thing I'm not going to do is offend the judge. You know, I'm not going to cuss him out the day before I'm going to stand in front of him and, and then think I'm going to get leniency from the judge. That's just stupidity. But this is what people do their whole life. So, you know, it, it's, 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 it's kind of weird to see how literally you can see the reprobate mind is the rejection of the Lord and continuing, continuing, continuing in darkness. So, I, I, like I said, people overcomplicate things and they want to extrapolate things almost to the point where it has no meaning, which is absolutely puzzling to me. You ought to get clarification as you gain more information, but it's exactly what the Bible says, ever learning, but never coming into the knowledge of the truth, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the truth. And whoever dies with him, I don't care what you got robbed of in, in this life and cheated. I mean, I do care. I hope that wouldn't happen to you, but what I'm saying is in the grand scheme of things, when we look at things, he who dies with Jesus wins because death is a hoax anyway. We don't die. We, the Bible describes it for believers as going to sleep. We pass from this life to life eternal. It, 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 we never die. <laughs> That's what Jesus was talking about because people, well, people die every day that are believers. No, they don't actually. They're leaving this present world and going to the next, which is actually more real than this one. So. <laughs> you know, so did I answer your question, Brother Luke, uh, satisfactorily here, yeah. or whoever's yeah, question this was? It wasn't okay. my question, but I loved your answer. Uh, the uh, okay, especially love the uh, death is a hoax, and here come the judge. You know, here I <laughs> I don't know how many years it's been since I heard the here come the judge, but uh, I think that was from some popular sitcom back. Yeah, back, I back think years. so too. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so thank you for. I love to reminisce on those old things like that. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, let's go uh, with. Um, um, do we dare go with with Steve or Ben? Do we? Okay, go ahead. Whoever, whoever's quick quickest on the draw, Steve or Ben, go. Here we go. I'm here. Okay, uh, I, I don't have a lot to say. Um, I I I did you know back in my early days when I was you know learning apologetics and just. Uh, really trying to, I felt like God was hedging me in. In fact, I love that verse in uh, Psalms. Uh, what is it? Psalm 139. I had up here a second ago to reference it. It's Psalm 139. Uh, it says that you have, you hedged me in from behind and before or, or something to that effect. And I felt that's what God was doing is that he had his hand on me, kind of guiding me. And everywhere I felt like there might be, oh, oh, well this, this, you know, there, there's a possibility this could be false even though I, I didn't believe it, but I, I felt like I needed to have an answer for all those things. Uh, he was he was hedging me in. He kept on plugging those holes, and it was inescapable to the point where it's like, okay, this is so obviously uh, 
the word of God. And, uh, and I, so I, I remember that during that time, I didn't have really take notes back then. I wish I did, but I had many profound thoughts about it. Uh, but a couple of things I, I do remember was, you know, for example, you know, how, how is it a hoax when, when there's, why would a book, how, how is it possible that a book uh, that was written over thousands of years about the perfect extreme of righteousness with zero compromise. Um, no man would come up with that such a thing. No man would come up with such a thing where they would exclude their own children, uh, mothers and fathers, um, and t for the sake of righteousness and uh, for sake of not compromising and have all these historical details so accurately uh, recorded for us. And you can see that again, you can see the fingerprints all through history that these that things actually happened. Uh, it's a pattern of evidence. Uh, that, in fact, there's a series of about the uh, Exodus. Uh, there's like four four films. It's called Patterns of Ev Evidence. If you haven't seen those, are, those are pretty good. Um, but anyways, I see I see a pattern of evidence all through history of that these things actually occurred. And again, no one no one is going to uh, do the things that have happened that can that can be proven from history for for the sake of a lie. Um, and again. You can't, uh, you can't, I can't see any malevolent force uh, being able to reveal such truth and love and righteousness. Uh, that, that, that is not the fruit of evil. Evil can't do those kind of things. Only, only tr true righteousness can um, have such fruit in such powerful words. Uh, that's one thing I, I kept it going back to early on is that there's no way this is, in fact, Paul even says that, that I think it's a, a verse that says, Paul, I think it's Paul who praises uh, his readership, saying, uh, "You know, you you understand that these are not the words of men, but the words of God." I love that verse as well because that uh, again, just reading the word alone uh, for me, it was it, it, the fact that it was I could like, like he, Jesus said, his his words are spirit and truth. They absolutely were spiritual, absolutely were truth, and they were absolutely alive. And so that quality, I've never. I've never read anything even close to it. So that's my answer. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, let's go with Sister Angel. Okay. So um, obviously this is a, the answer is false, but uh, I'll just add that um, when, uh, I don't know, like when I was in my early to mid 20s, um, several years, like, you know, before I got saved, which was around 30, I, uh, I started reading this book called the old serpent chain. And it is a book all about this idea that the old Testament God is, um, is evil. And that Jesus actually spoke in code, trying to convey that fact to the world, but in, in such a way that only, only certain people would get it right and that he was set, coming here to set us free, not from the law, but from the God that gave us the law, right? And I don't even know why I felt compelled to, to you know, like, or, or, or compelled by this, this idea. I guess it was just some part in my heart that already really wanted Jesus, even though I didn't think I did. Because I, I don't see why I would, how, why that would have appealed to me, except that I didn't understand the Old Testament yet. But I had come to, to really respect and appreciate Jesus in my even in my you know late teens when I saw the Passion of the Christ and I and I saw played out before my eyes like okay so if this story is true this is what this man went through you know which I just never had considered uh, prior to that so I I do actually I know people's opinions are mixed but I uh, I really uh, appreciate that film quite a bit because it did something for me that. Uh, it, you know, nothing else ever had at that point. Um, but I think it also, you know, because in the past, I, I wouldn't have even cared about this, this Gnostic teaching because I, I, I didn't, I wasn't trying to somehow keep Jesus and exclude the Bible. I was like not interested in either one, right? But somehow uh, in my, you know, mid-20s, this book came along and it appealed to me because it's a lazy way out. Instead of working to understand what the Old Testament saying, what the point of it all is, it's just telling you, no, 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 just take the warm and fuzzy things Jesus said, and the rest is written by the devil, which is what the book teaches. Um, <laughs> and it's so dumb, 
and uh, it's intellectually lazy. I've seen so many people in chat rooms and stuff saying things like this, or, you know, they try to say like in, uh, in certain like anti-Zionist channels, they'll try to say, Oh, the Jews wrote the Bible. You know, it's basically like a Jewish conspiracy. <laughs> like why would they write a buy a book that like condemns them? Uh, you haven't even read it. If that's what you think, <laughs> Like, you don't even know what the Bible says if you think they wrote it. Uh, like, it was like some plot that they wrote all by themselves, like, to trick everybody. That's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but it's just the same type of thing when people, when people don't want to do the work, don't want to, to do the study and really just the, um, uh, the, the humbling, you know, that, that, that's required to, to come to the Bible and, uh, and not, you know, get your dander up, get your defenses up, feel prideful, and and, and just the first uh, the first thing that the Bible says that makes you somehow feel judged or condemned. You know that you just automatically close your ears and try to find any way to make it not true. Um, they they go to this this idea where the Old Testament was written by an evil God, and because they're just they're just too lazy to actually <laughs> just just read it just actually read it like what if you actually read it and, and study the parts i mean it's easy now with google I, I mean you could you could find a million websites that will explain what the old testament was trying to say and how no god was not evil in the old testament it's just, they don't want to know it because their pride you know it, 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 they're drawn to to you know the words of jesus and not really not in truth let's be honest you know not so much but it's just that they could they could, uh, they feel like they could uh, tolerate Jesus because they don't, they don't feel like he's inconveniencing them too much. Because Jesus didn't spend a whole lot of time um, preaching against like, you know, overt sinners. He was, he was against the Pharisees. You know, when he was speaking, he was, ta he was condemning these sanctimonious Pharisees. And so these people that don't understand the whole of the Bible, they feel like that lets them off the hook because, you know, they can't even get far enough along to, to figure out maybe why some of the things God identifies as sin that they do and enjoy, why they might actually be sin. You know, they don't even want to go that far. They, they like to commit adultery or they like to, they like to fornicate or they like to, you know, I mean, any like, you know, lie, whatever it is, they, uh, they don't even want to just, just, just be reasonable and objective enough to, to 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 stand outside of themselves and say okay but can i understand why a holy god would at least call that sin you know they that, that's too much for them so so this is just a really convenient cope uh this this idea that that you know the god of the bible especially the old testament is a demiurge i'm not sure if people have heard of the of the the brand of this gnosticism where they where they say jesus was the liberator uh that, you know he was like uh superhero that came in to, to, to uh, low-key undo all the damage that the Old Testament did, you know, and, and, and basically defeat that, that evil God, <laughs> right, uh, uh, that foreshadowed him. And, you know, it, it's ridiculous. It's very easy to screw. But the thing I wanted to say was that book, The Old Serpent Chain, is the only book I ever burned after getting saved. I burned that book because I thought it was so evil because it it's just so tempting for a lazy person that doesn't even get to the point where they want to study you know they they just get far enough where that where they like jesus and they want to somehow keep jesus but reject the bible right and this this type of philosophy just gives them that out gives them away and it has some very uh deceitful but clever justifications like when it used the the word like the the you know the the verse about the wheat and the tares, it, you know, the way that this book interpreted it was um, that the reason Jesus had to speak in code and parables was that at the time that he was, uh, you know, on earth, uh, the, the, or no, it was, I'm trying to think of it was the wheat and the chaff. It, it, basically, he, they were, I'm trying to remember what that book says. Um, what, one of these things was interpreted to, to prove that uh, Jesus uh, was speaking in code because the people back then weren't ready. They weren't ready to hear the truth. So that's why he didn't just flat out say that the God of the Old Testament is evil, right? And that, um, you know, you know, at a certain time in the future, everybody would be ready and that this was the great revelation. But no, this is, this is evil and the internet has only made it grow 
just that much more, I think. Um, uh, and, and I, it's so common. Like you, you go into a secular chat room, especially in the truth community. So quote unquote, right. And which is, you know, no, no coincidence because the entire idea of the truth, the truth movement is, is Gnosticism. It's just, it's a Gnostic psyop in a lot of ways. Not to say that, that, that there a lot of truth hasn't been revealed, but a lot of people now they, they worship what they call truth but they they worship it apart from jesus christ so uh i've but you know i'm starting to see exactly what the whole purpose of this whole thing was um from the beginning <laughs> the worship of gnosis but um you, you go into any of these chat rooms and you know you start talking about the bible or jesus and you know most of the time now i will see you know a good 70 percent of people uh affirming jesus and you know at least considering themselves to be christians but uh, just without fail, every time I see some Gnostic in there trying to twist, uh, twist the Bible, either, you know, charging God, you know, as evil or, or trying to tell believers that they got the Bible all wrong and that it's mystical and da, 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 you know, and this is very pernicious. Uh, I will just end it by calling out on a popular channel. There's a, a channel called No More News, K-N-O-W. There's a very sinister uh, guest who's the most frequent guest on that channel. His name is Christopher John Bjorkness, and he is a he is a wicked Gnostic, and he veils what he says to where he catches you off guard because you almost you almost think he's uh, you know a Christian when you first hear him speak or you could assume it, um, and then he starts in a very sly way uh, slipping in all this stuff about the old testament god being evil and i don't I, I don't know if anybody that watches my channel is listening but i just wanted to point that out because i've seen uh, a lot of people get kind of slipped, tricked up by this like they especially if they're seeking if they're if they're they're trying to they're trying to understand the bible they're not really um like people like me that I, you know i i wasn't I didn't grow up believing so um kind of coming at it from an unbelieving perspective it's really easy to fall into this trap so I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. But uh, thank you guys. Hmm. Do it. That's interesting. I uh, you burned a book. Well, um, yes, that was the only one. <laughs> I've, never, not... I've never burned a book, but there's a book that I threw away. I I probably should have burned it to make sure nobody else read it. But I only read about. See, I had books. lent it out to people. That was another thing. I felt very guilty about that. That I had recommended it, and lent it out. So that was another reason I burned it. But go, go on. Sorry, Luke. I forgot to say that. Uh, I don't know how many here uh, have familiar with Mark, Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens. You know, he's considered a, one of the great uh, American writers and with a lot of, you know, wisdom. And uh, but so I was eager to read a book that uh, uh, it was released. Uh, I think a hundred years after his death. Uh, he it was in his his will or something. He didn't want it released until then, and uh, I can see why because it was like the, the most uh, anti God book I've ever read. It was just the most horrible thing. Only about thirty or forty pages into it, I was just so disgusted. I just I couldn't even go any further. But I didn't burn it. Um, all right. It was uh, more of a spirit. Like for me, I felt like there was evil attached to it, and I had just yes. gotten saved, and I didn't know what to do. But I just, I just that made me feel better. I felt a lot better after I did. But um, I will say, my 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 best friend that I refer to a lot, she is related to Mark Twain, so it doesn't surprise me what you okay. said about that uh, that book, considering what I know about her family. So, yeah. <laughs> all right, um, brother Steve. Yes, we, sir. Did we save the best for last on this question? <laughs> I don't know the best for last. I thought uh, all of the answers were great. And uh, Lisa stole the scripture I was going to use, but <laughs> I think that was for a reason. Um, God always has a reason for doing things, but uh, which made me look for other verses in the Bible uh, to affirm the truth that that, aunt, that question uh is is uh completely false um absolutely unequivocally false <clears throat> and 
so uh, somebody said in the chat, I need to look up what malevolent means. I think Luke explained it, but basically it's to, uh, it's to someone doing something with the purpose and intent of, of doing evil to someone. Um, and for someone to suggest that, um, that the Bible then would be, ha would have been written with evil intent. Um, and then by, by beings, uh, that also is, um, <clears throat> not scriptural as well and i'm not mocking the questioner but the question needs to be taken very seriously that this is something that we absolutely do not agree with um and there there are a lot of uh historical things that can point to the fact of the Bible standing the test of time and proving that it is God's word. One, one scripture off the top of my head is that uh, God would preserve his word. Well, they've tried and you can look this up in history. They have tried to get rid of the Bible. There were Bible burnings in Rome and, and, uh, several other times where they tried to get rid of the Bible. They tried to get rid of scripture and God has preserved his word. Um, I also put a link in the chat to, uh, I just found it, um, a list of 75 scriptures that uh, affirm God's word. But uh, uh, when I was looking for something, I found two passages, two short passages. I just want to read through. Uh uh, that that show how seriously God takes his word. And in one, in the Old Testament, is the gospel uh, again. It's in Isaiah 45, uh, verse 11 is where I'm going to start. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. And it's important to note that, that – uh, that we, Paul talks about the fact that we were grafted into Israel. Uh, if, if you're ever, you know, in church and in, in like uh, Sunday school, you probably sung the song, Father Abraham had many sons, had many sons and Father Abraham. And I want one of them and so are you. So let's praise the Lord. How, how are we one of them? Because Abraham was was promised that he would be the father of many nations. How? By faith. Um, that, that he would be the father of many nations. That's how we're grafted in to Israel. So that's important in this passage. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, which includes us and his maker, ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands command ye me. I have made the, the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands have stretched out the heavens and all their host have I commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city and he shall let go my captives, not for price or, nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. Thus saith the Lord, the labor of Egypt and merchandise of Ethiopia and of the Sabaeans, men of stature, shall come over unto thee, and they shall be thine. They shall come after thee in chains. They shall come over, and they shall fall down unto thee. They shall make supplication unto thee, saying, Surely God is in thee, and there is none else. There is no God. Verily. Thou art a God that hidest thyself, O God of Israel, the Savior. They shall be ashamed and also confounded, all of them. They shall go to confusion together that are makers of idols. Lisa pointed out that all those sins that God gave them over to was because it started out with idolatry and and going after other gods and not believing in Jesus. But 
Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens. God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited, I am the Lord and there is none else, which goes against the 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 plurality of the question that that God is, is triune but he is still one i am the lord and there is none else i have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth i said not unto the seed of jacob seek ye me in vain i am the lord speak righteousness i declare things that are right assemble yourselves and come draw near together ye that are escaped of the nations they have no knowledge that set up wood of their graven image and pray unto a god that cannot save tell ye and bring them near <coughs> yea that Yea, let them take counsel together who hath declared this from ancient time, who hath told it from that time. Have not I the Lord, and there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me, and look unto me, and be ye saved." all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself. The word is gone out from out of my mouth in righteousness. I shall not and shall not return that unto me. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one day in the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed in the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. But he says, I've sworn by myself. The next verse is in Psalm 138 two verses this is david speaking i will praise thee with my whole heart before the gods will i sing praise unto thee i will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name so God swears by himself, by his own name, but he puts his word above himself. He swears by that, that his, he will do his word. And so when we talk about how seriously God takes his word and for someone to come against that and say that, it was created by some other beings and done with malevolent intent <clears throat> when all throughout the scripture, including the Old Testament, clearly seen in Isaiah 45, the gospel. That was clear as day to me, the gospel. So it's always been written to save, not for ill intent. And someone to say that I do believe Angel is absolutely right. That is a Luciferian agenda from Satan to deceive. It is an antichrist spirit. So absolutely unequivocally, no, God wrote his word written. God authored his word. It was written by men under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. <laughs> Great answer, brother. Um, I noticed that uh, you even moved into a preaching mood, a mode. So you started preaching a little bit there. That was wonderful. But 
Uh, and another I, thing I, I can't learned, help it. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, <laughs> Sister, Sister Lisa probably appreciated that too. She she's um, been known for doing some preaching herself. Uh, but I, I another thing I noticed, brother, not only now, but uh, uh, re in your recent uh, talks, uh, you seem to be quoting a lot of scripture lately, and uh, uh, that's something that I would encourage everybody to, to do more of that. Um, I started asking the question on Friday nights, especially uh, in, because we were answering extemporaneously. We, we're not preparing uh, a, a presentation, so uh, we give our, a lot of our own thoughts. But uh, so it, it begs the question: Where does it say that? Uh, you know, whatever position we're we're uh, taking, uh, it'll be nice to show where does it say that in the bible and so uh yeah we should include scripture as much as possible uh, uh in all our discussions it's it's very powerful isn't it doesn't it say the scripture is powerful all right yes yeah. yes yes that's uh in hebrews i believe chapter four for the word of god is uh quick powerful and active uh something like that uh discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart even to dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow uh, that the, the word of god is our sword mm -hmm. um so it is both written and spoken and has been spoken yeah. and and god continues to speak so he, he spoke from the beginning that's yeah. how we know he, 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 you know, he spoke the word and created the world. So, and, 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 and that has been one of my, um, uh, not say constant, but uh, persistent uh, criticisms of uh, uh, someone that we used to collaborate with uh, that uh, a, lot, a lot of things were said. And I always said, well, Where's where's that in the script in the Bible? Can show me show me a scripture to support that. And that was it was it was generally lacking. So uh, I'm glad it uh, I'm glad to hear you doing that. And I think it's a good a lesson for all of us to try to include scriptures as much as possible. Uh, all right, uh, and, and we can go to this question unless someone wants to say more about this one. Anyone? The only thing I would say is, um, <clears throat> like Angel said and Steve said, a lot of people said. Uh, Gnosticism it can it, it appeals to the intellect uh, to knowledge and um, even though it may sound right uh, even like you know for example you may say well well angel Jesus that book I didn't hear anything that was I, yes it was heretical but I didn't think I didn't hear anything that was necessarily keep able for being saved for example but what they do is they slip it in they it's 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 packaged where they'll say things like oh well Jesus did come in the flesh or Jesus wasn't really God even though he was a, he's the hero of the story. Uh, he's not God, or he's not, he didn't come to the flesh. And again, that's obviously damnable, I believe. Um, and that's what First John is essentially about. Um, and also, too, it's an, again, it appeals to man's intellect or his every, everyday reasoning. And uh, like we talked about, like Luke said a minute ago about uh, people that have recently uh, we've uh, had to part ways with, uh, things that they would always emphasize is the quality and the intimacy of the relationship Again, that comes after salvation. That's the, they, but they would put that uh, ahead of salvation. And again, that's it's really a Gnosticism where you're you, how well you know somebody. Uh, you know, so and, and what? I, uh, by the way, uh, Steve, you did an awesome job because there, there was a person that was asking that question. They needed to hear exactly what you said. So that was an amazing response. I hope he hears it. Um, and uh, I guess that's all I'll say. Are we ready for the next question? I'm ready. Okay. This one was, it's been in the queue for a while now, uh, but we've gotten to it and it is true or false quote unquote accountability groups slash partners where believers monitor and report to each other is an effective means of keeping our sin nature from satisfying its desires. So again, accountability groups or partners is where believers monitor and report to each other is an effective means of keeping our sin nature from satisfying its desires. Hmm. 
I wish I wish it had been condensed a little bit because I can I'll have to read it and study the question a little bit first. Uh, but uh, okay, who wants to go first on that one? I do. I do. I do. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. <laughs> okay. Um, I can see where that can be helpful, but it can also uh, be dangerous, especially if you don't pick, pick the right accountability partner. Okay. I've warned people about this stuff from the beginning. Really, you know, the Holy Spirit is your accountability partner. You want somebody who's going to keep you honest. He going to definitely keep you honest. He don't miss. I, 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 I'm concerned when people start relying on anything other than the Lord. Now, I, I know the Bible says confess your faults one to another. And I've warned people, don't be foolish with that either. Everybody don't need to know the deepest, darkest secrets of your heart just because they name the name of Christ. There are people that use that as weapons against people. A lot of these so-called Christian, and I use the term loosely, ministries use that stuff to use it against people. And there are a whole bunch of people that can say amen to that. They got burned by that where they go and they tell something to a pastor or a minister or associate pastor or something. And then they end up using that stuff against them to manipulate them and, and make them feel guilty and all that. And I talked about that in um, the broadcast that I did with Brother Fitz a couple of weeks ago uh, where we talked about witchcraft in the church. And some of the witchcraft tactics they use. And this this could actually fall into that if the person has nefarious intentions. So I, let's say you need to be prayerful. Beloved, don't just because somebody say they believe or be running telling all your business. OK, um, you know, and I don't know if they got whole things set up where people try to be accountability partners to some ministry or whatever. Just be prayerful and careful with that stuff. You know, uh, go to the Lord with your stuff first. And if you're really, really struggling with something, I'm telling you, I'll just, I'll just beseech him. I just bombard heaven with, with my prayers and seeking the Lord and fasting and getting into his word. I'm just not sold on this whole accountability partner thing. And I'm not saying there ain't, can't be some good in it and that can be good, but be prayerful and careful. Don't look deep before you leave. Mm -hmm. uh, and don't, just don't run around just telling everybody your business just because just they say they're a believer. I'm just, I'm just warning you. Some of this stuff is not good. Um, when you confess your faults one to another, you know what that's really talking about. I people always think it's when you are still struggling with something. I'm not perceiving that. Now you take it and leave it. It's up I, to I you. I thought it was like admitting wrongdoing, like if you did did somebody wrong. You know what I mean? Like not not being too proud to admit. Mm -hmm. like about I understand what you're saying, Sister brothers. Angel, but well, what I was trying to get at is that I believe it's when you overcome. That you confess your fault. Mm. See, when Jesus said, don't, don't go messing with the moat that's in your brother's eye until you take care of the beam that is in your own eye. Yeah. He is talking about conquer the thing that's troubling you before you go try to help somebody else. So if you're struggling with something and you get before the Lord and you beseech the Lord and you're fasting, you're praying, you're getting in his word, you learn about the tactics of the enemy and you learn how the devil is just trying to keep you in a snare to keep you uh, defeated in an area, okay, and to keep you ineffectual as a believer. And then you overcome that thing. Now I can go help my brother who's struggling because I defeated it and I'm not coming in judgment. I'm coming to show him how to defeat the devil's tactics. So that's that's the way I perceive that. I'm not even perceiving that as, oh, let me confess in my sin what I'm struggling with. Then, then you got two people in misery confessing and going around the same circle. And usually that's why you see right there in that admonishment, considering thyself, unless you, you fall. So, you know, make sure you are already strong in that thing before you undertake helping somebody else, because then y'all can both fall back in the pit together. So, <laughs> Be prayerful. Seek the Lord. He's your first go-to. He is your first go-to. Uh, when, when I see people, when they're successful with their confessing their faults one to another, is the person who has overcome it, and they're able to help their brother or sister out of the trap they've fallen in. It's not two people struggling with the same thing, confessing the same thing to each other. So just seek the Lord, y'all. Seek the Lord first on everything. He's your go-to guy. Okay? That's all I got to say. Hmm. 
Yeah, I think very interesting points. And I, I, Angel, you, you were making a point I thought was really interesting. So why don't you go next? Well, just reading the context of the, the of the chapter here, I'll go because um, I haven't actually ever thought about this. The only time I've ever thought about this is when I was briefly in AA. I wasn't an alcoholic, but for for opioids, when I was in AA, you don't want to go to NA. They're even worse. <laughs> They're just usually the people in there. They're even are even worse. But um, uh, this is where I first came. I heard of this concept, um, which automatically biases me against it because I I find it to be just. I don't know. I, I still not even sure exactly where I stand on AA and things like that. But uh, 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 the idea of of putting of putting that much trust in another person it reminds me of like a sponsor, right? Uh, having a sponsor. But here, so let's look at the uh, uh, James five. James five. I guess we'll start at uh, fourteen. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray for pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So I'll have two thoughts on this. One, when I, just, just upon hearing it in general, I would think that, rather than encouraging us to make sponsors of one another, where we kind of just uh, we go and pick somebody to entrust with all of our deep, dark, dirty secrets and just regularly volunteer them up um, uh, and kind of in, in doing so kind of dwell on them, by the way. Uh, I would think that in one way, this would be more relevant to, to actually just being humble enough to, if you've done something wrong, when, there, when there's any type of discord between one, you know, uh, the brethren, you need to be willing to, to you know, confess your faults where, where you've maybe gone wrong, something, you know, like something you've said or, or just like a tendency that you have. Uh, this is necessary for harmony within any group um, or in just any relationship in general. So just being willing to confess your faults one to another uh, is, is, I think, uh, absolutely uh, healthy and necessary in any type of fellowship. But also, it looks like this is in the context of if somebody's uh, sick um, or, uh, you know, uh, they, they, you know, maybe they feel like they're experiencing chastisement. Um, so it might it might make sense that in this case, in this particular case, in these situations, because they're praying and they're trying to get healing for somebody, it would might it might make sense that they would. Um, you know, share what they, what they, you know, what they feel that they've been doing that got them into this situation. You know, and a lot of times when we get sick, um, chastisement or not, just, just, the, just something that we're, we've been doing our lifestyle choices have something to do with it. So I don't, now I, I listen, I've never tried to, I've never really thought about this. So I've never gone through the, the scripture to look and see all the possible justifications for accountability partners that but just at least within uh, this passage, I don't really see uh, <laughs> I don't really see the the uh, uh, the justification for it. Um, and I've I've seen a lot of uh, creepy uh, cult like abusive things come from this practice, and they do use this verse to to to, to justify it and to and to uh, defend it. So, but so I, I, I'm just going to say undecided because I don't know, there could be a stellar argument that I have yet to hear for why this is a good idea. Um, but it just seems like a dangerous thing to make a general recommendation for believers. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, like to, if you were to, uh, you know, <laughs> apply this in a general sense where you encourage people in general to do this, it seems like it would, it could lead to more trouble than anything else. Like Lisa was saying. So, <sighs> mm, mm. Wow. Well, uh, brothers, I, I think that the, the sisters here have a lot of wisdom, don't they? Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, well, let me go next. Indeed. Uh, um, the uh, the idea of an accountability partner, um, I, I don't think we find anything in the Bible that would... Um, uh, the, the, certainly the term is not in the Bible. I don't think the concept is in the Bible. Uh, and and the, the verse that's been uh, mentioned uh, as far as confessing your faults to each other, 
uh, I, I think that the answers given by uh, Lisa and Angel is um, very, very good. So let, I think that should settle that. I, I, I don't think it's a good idea, but also uh, it is good to keep this a warning in mind that um, I don't think we should say things to anybody privately that uh, we would object if it was recorded and played publicly. Um, that's a policy that uh, my mother taught me when I was young that uh, I think is very, very wise. Um, and I, I've tried to do that. I, I, I think for the most part, I do practice that so that um, uh, it's not, it couldn't be gossiping if, if I'm saying something to somebody that I, hey, if this was being broadcast live right now or, or if it was recorded and repeated, I would not be embarrassed. And that I think that's a a, uh, a policy that uh, you know would be wise for everybody to ad adopt that. Uh, but sharing you know, information that you would be embarrassed or or so private that you don't want everybody to know with any individual. Just remember that uh, <laughs> I'll tell you from my own experiences. Uh, I, some of the people I've I've worked most closely with and develop the closest relationships with in, in, in ministry, uh, there's a, a division eventually comes and then instead of going our separate ways peacefully, uh, some of these people decide that now you're an enemy and they're, they seek to destroy you however they can. And that becomes their, their, their mission more than anything else. That's not the gospel. It's not fellowship. It's, it's nothing. All that matters is trying to destroy someone that you know you used to love each other and and now their uh, their goal is only to destroy you so uh i would be very very careful uh, uh saying anything unless you were very willing for that to be said publicly um now the, the idea of discipling though i i, I think is uh, appropriate but i wouldn't um i don't feel comfortable with uh, making it an official relationship. It's just discipling someone in the act of your, your just your walk and your fellowship. And uh, if you've, if you've uh, come across someone that is, um, and, and you can help because you have experience and maturity and, and they're just a beginning and to be able to help them to try to grow. This is a natural thing that we should all be doing without declaring ourselves as the teacher and they're my disciple. I, 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 I would be very uncomfortable with uh, making that a formal relationship. Uh, and I would say the same thing, applying it as, as a accountability partner the same way. I, I would not be comfortable with that. Uh, now, can it be effective in, in sin? Uh, um, I don't know if there's really any value in, in uh, in doing that uh, in terms of helping you overcome sin. I think that really we're supposed to be going directly to the Lord. Um, you know, that we do have an intercessor, it's Jesus. It's not supposed to be another person where we go directly to the Lord. Um, all right, um, Brother Steve, why don't you go next? Okay. Um Let's see here. So that passage that y'all were talking about was in James, James five. Um, <clears throat> there, there, there is a context, but I don't think it's just about sickness. And I definitely agree with what both, what all of you have said that if you are to enter into some type of accountability relationship with someone where you know, and the way that's that question is worded, I don't particularly like. Um, but uh, can you have someone that you trust that can help keep you accountable? Sure. <clears throat> in in that way. But it must be someone if you're going to do that must be someone a who understands the gospel that that they're that, that that the gospel is of grace and it's not of works and there's nothing you can do 
that can separate you. So in that freedom and with someone that you trust, yes, I think that can be helpful, but there again, as has been pointed out, it can be used against you. Also, I think that it's also good to point out that, um, that there are things that should remain between you and God. Um, and there's scriptural evidence for that. Um, but uh, in James, it's chapter five, he lists several things that he gives an answer to, to what a believer should do. Is any, is uh, verse 13, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick <clears throat> and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So there is the, the there is several things in the passage as a whole that that James lists that we should do um, individually and and corporately uh, for each other. Um, Paul kind of repeats this in Galatians chapter six, brethren, if, I'm, and this was kind of what, uh, um, Lisa was, was pointing to, I believe, uh, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye, which are spiritual restore such and one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself lest thou also be tempted, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. I think that's what James was getting at in, in confessing your faults one to another, but this is more of the how to do that that Paul is laying out, I think, and that you should be very careful lest you be tempted by what you hear. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. So here again, there's <clears throat> in both James and Galatians, there's this idea of some things you you bring to leaders in the church that are that are spiritual that are grounded and rooted and they should check themselves before they do um and there's things here again that that we bear ourselves but we also bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of christ <clears throat> but to further prove this idea uh want to give you just a couple more uh, scripture verses, if I may. Uh, this is Abraham. Many of us know the story about Abraham and his son, and he takes him to the, to the altar to sacrifice him on the altar. But the important thing here is in ver chapter 22 in Genesis, uh, and Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his ass or donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and claved the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place which God had told him. <clears throat> and then on the third day, the, the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, abide here with the ass and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. So Abraham sets out from his family, a, a larger group of people with a smaller group of people, then tells them to wait. Where do we see that happen? Where Abraham goes off on his own with his son. How about Matthew 26? This is Jesus. And he went a little further and fell on his face 
and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So Jesus brought, went out to the garden to pray, went a little further with just the three, and now further by himself to just him and God. Same thing with Abraham. And another correlating passage to this is Acts 27. Um, this is Paul in the ship that's going to be shipwrecked. But when the 14th night was come and they were, as we were driven up and down in Adria about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country and sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. Then fearing less we should have fallen upon rocks. They cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. <clears throat> and the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship. And when they had let down the boat into the sea under color, as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except ye abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved, which is another, like you could go back to Noah's Ark with that. If you're in the ship, you're saved. If you're not in the ship, you're not saved. Um, so, but there's three examples of going a little further uh, than than where you were. But I think the first two are the most important in saying and showing that even Jesus, our Savior, had things he only talked to his Father about privately. And I think the same is true for us. We might have a corporate body that we can ask for 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 prayer with about certain things. And then we might have a smaller group that we can talk to and share things with, but then there's some things like Luke said, that need to only be uttered between you and God and let God lead you about, you know, whether, whether you eventually share them with people or not. But I think Lisa had a great point there that when you have overcome something, that's the best time to share it so that others might be healed as well. Thank you. I appreciate you saying thank you uh, at the end because that tells me that you're finished, brother. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> Just part of a, a technique that's good and that will be useful. <laughs> Thank you for that answer. And uh, the only one remaining now is uh, our brother Ben. Is there anything left to be said? Uh, I think a little bit, yes. Um, the The reason God, I think one of the reasons God gave us his Holy Spirit um, is not only for the down payment uh, for the redemption, but also to guide us and, and to empower us. And so, um, so with regards to the, the accountability groups, I mean, uh, accountability groups are really uh, law enforcers, if you think about it, and the law can never um, uh, suppress or stifle sin. It only arouses sin. Um, and so accountability groups might be good for some things that, with regards to, um, uh, you know, just generally, are, are, are you are you at where you're, you know, so we could check on check in on each other, essentially. So say, hey, well, uh, you know, how are you doing? Are you, you know, so you know if that person's engaged in, in sin or not. I'm not saying it's a, a, necessarily a good idea, but if you know someone who's struggling with a particular sin and uh, it might be a good idea to check on them periodically. But ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit that that is going to be the the only way someone's going to get victory over that sin. I mean, if, if again, the law, if we if we're not if the, the law given by God, which we know it's by God, given by God, if that didn't uh, stop sin. Uh, certainly it's not going to stop any, any law that man imposes, uh, is not, not going to be heeded to either. In fact, um, you know, it, it, accountability groups on, on the surface might stop sin, the occurrences, maybe like the frequency of, but, 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 but when they, when the person actually does slip up, uh, they're probably gonna slip pretty hard. Um, 
And so again, I'm not saying there's there's some good yes, but uh, and ultimately you're only going to get victory by the Holy Spirit, and that's why He gave us the Holy Spirit so we can set our mind on the things of God and not things of the flesh, so we can be motivated by that. Uh, I think that's what Romans seven and eight is about. I believe that sec- that's what Second Peter is about as well, where he's worrying about false teachers, about falling into their false teaching of lewdness. Uh, he says, uh, add to these things, add to your faith. Uh, you know, virtue, blood, brotherly love, knowledge, etc. It's a recipe for building yourself up in the faith so that you don't uh, stumble. Um, because, uh, again, if your mind is preoccupied with things of the spirit, well, then it, by, by default, it's not uh, occupied on the things of the flesh. The more of the things you, you think about the things that the, of your the uh, desires of your flesh, the more you're aroused and the more you're going to want to... Uh, the more t- more time you spend, you set your mind on it. The, the, it it's only going to make you want to do those things more and, and make you weak. That's why, uh, again, uh, focusing on the things of the spirit is is a way to uh, the way to overcome that because it's a great, great and precious promises uh, that is supposed to motivate us to so that we can escape the lust of the world. And uh, if we set our minds on those things, sowing to that, um, that should be our, our primary motivation um, because again, we're, we're we're desiring the things of the spirit, not the things of the flesh. But it, it is a, a a moment by moment choice whether whether or not we choose to yield to the spirit or yield to the flesh. So uh, again, I, I would say don't don't uh, rely on man for for uh, uh, conquering sin. Uh, get get yourself in the Word of God. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um... Well, does anybody want to add more before we move on? Ask this question. Yes. Go ahead, Steve. Um, I I totally agree with with what Ben said as well. He just reminded me of of one thing that I that I did want to say, and I, I agree with the premise of it. If if you're focusing on the sin, that's where your mind is going to be stayed on, and that we should should focus our mind on Christ. And that's how we, that's how we overcome these things. Um, I, I will say that, that, uh, the w- one thing that could show the difference between the, w- what I could see a right way and wrong way of doing it is where AA, uh, can be helpful with people, but it's too focused on, on, uh, on only, talking about what you did and with and it, no, it makes you identify yourself as right that thing. right like every time right, you never right. get to be free of it you could be right. sober 20 years and you still i'm angel i'm an alcoholic like that right curse, right that's cursing right 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 where where, where exactly there's there's a lot there to that um whereas there's a similar program um uh, called celebrate recovery that I was involved with that was exceptionally uh, helpful and healthy uh, in that the grace of God was evident in, in it um, and was always uh, at least the ones that I, you know, that I was a part of. Um, and the, the, that's why I say that if you're going to, be accountable to someone or to a group of people or whatever the case is where you share what's going on in your life and that, that you're not being judged by that. You're not. And even with what angel said, judging yourself because there's a difference between saying I am this or I am that then saying I struggle with an addiction to alcohol or an addiction to, to overeating or codependency, or you, you know, you name it, the struggle, you know, that's, that's totally different. That's just being honest with what you particularly struggle with and be able to share that with someone and them not say, Oh, you're going to hell or any type of judgment or anything. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because that was one of the, that like there are times that I, I long because there's, 
there is no group like that near me that I could be regularly involved with. And to me, that was the closest thing to, to what I see in acts and what I believe God wanted the church to be like where we support each other and, and we can share what's going on in our lives without judgment and yet, and celebrate any time that has passed that you have victory over whatever you're struggling with. And that's the point. That's why it's called celebrate recovery, whether it's an hour that you have, that you have victory in it. Like, even if it's just the time you've been there together with these people that you didn't take a drink that day for those three hours, we celebrate that because we're not judging the sin because if you are in Christ, there is no judgment. There is no condemnation. There is celebrating the victory that you have just, just that day or those, you know, three days, a few months, whatever it is, or years <clears throat> that, there is a freedom in being able to air out the darkness into the light that you struggle with, that there is something to that, that needs to be, um, you know, uh, looked at here with this because we know that, that biblically speaking, things that are hidden are uh, grow. And I, I can't think of a particular passage in scripture, but it's there. If you go look for it, um, that when we allow things to stay in our life, it corrupts our walk. And when we shed light on it, bring something into the light, it does remove the power of it. But like Ben said, that should not be our, our primary way of trying to deal with something. Yes, you can get it out. Sometimes it's just as simple as being honest with yourself that you struggle with something that, you know, like, like Angel said, people don't even admit to themselves that they're sinning in doing these things, you know, that, 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 that what they're doing is breaking God's law that they need a savior therefore. So that's important that, you know, that that's, but you do need to be careful if you're going to tell people you're, you know, and show people your dirty laundry that, it's done in a place with people that you can unequivocally trust and know that you will not be judged. It won't be used against you later. But with that being said, I want this one verse to overshadow this, that no matter what would happen, if you do decide to, that you need to tell what's going on in your life to someone that even if they were to betray you, there's this promise from God that we know in, that God causes all things to work together for the good of them that love the Lord. All things. The good and the bad that we perceive to happen in our life, God causes all things to work together for the good. It's like when you, when you bake bread, you, you need flour and baking soda and, and water at the very least. Well, baking soda don't taste good if you've ever tried it, but the finished product tastes wonderful. So that's just a physical example of that scripture. God knows what he's doing. Thank you. Sorry for going on longer than I wanted. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you took me back to my childhood. When, when I was growing up, we were so poor 
some days the only thing I got to eat was was a bowl of baking soda. Oh my. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> I was hoping so, but you <laughs> never know. <laughs> no, I, I never had to eat a bowl of baking soda. Some days all I got was a bowl of dirt to, to eat, though, I can tell you that. All right, let's move on. Um, okay, looks like we only have enough time now to uh, finish up here. Unless so, anybody wants to say more about this question or any of the questions tonight. All right. Okay, let's uh, let's look at the chat room here. They've had an interesting conversation going on about AA. If anybody has anything they want to add to, to that. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, Ben, uh, there's a question from Mia Pratt that you could. Will you save that so that you can yes, add I that? Got it. Okay, yes, you got, you, yeah. you got it. Good. Okay. Um, all right, let's let's start off with our our, our summary remarks, and uh, we get enough time so everybody can take their time with this. Uh, uh, let's let's start with uh, Sister Lisa, and also Lisa, tell us what what's going on tomorrow night on your program. Um, okay, let's see. I think I think that some people are getting their feelings hurt because they've had family <laughs> that were. Uh, made free from alcoholism in uh, AA, and they're not understanding that they don't understand the tenets of AA are based on stylized religion. It is a cult that denies the deity of Christ. It's just cloaked in um, what, philosophy, and the Bible warns against these vain philosophies. Now, I say it couldn't be good. Somebody go could go there and the get orange papers. Tell them to read the right. orange papers. They do Google need that. To, I tried to point them to that. That they need oh, to read you know the Bible. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. The, the well, orange papers like the Masonic underpinnings of it. Right. And the founder right. admitted that, when I that he got yeah. his doctrine from spirits, and it wasn't the spirit of the Lord. Now, that don't mean people can't get set free from alcohol. Praise God if they do. They still need yeah. Jesus, which was the point. You know, but, hey, whatever. Uh, you want to lick all over LA and uh, 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 AA and love all over LA? Go ahead. It's a false way to lead people away from Christ about their higher self and the knowledge of a God, but not the God. That's that's the same thing as any cult. But you know, hey, people get offended at the truth. So then enjoy your offense. I don't know what to tell you. I don't apologize for the truth. Tomorrow night we're going to be talking about. Uh, if Sister Angel is is still wanting to do it, the um, monarch butterflies. Yes. And also, I would like to invite Brother Ben to consider what he's going to talk about. Cause I'm putting him on the spot tomorrow. He's going to do a segment whether whether he likes it or not. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's too quiet in the background. I want him to talk about things that he's interested in. So, Ben, I'm inviting you to come up with something you'd like to discuss tomorrow night. But um, it's just going to be a discussion. We're going to have some fun tomorrow night. And relax and enjoy ourselves in the Lord. That's what it's about. It's sitting down and having a conversation as believers in Jesus and considering the things we see going on in our world. And people want to come in and throw rocks and bring rocks. And I'm like, please drop your rocks at the door because we're all believers. Whether you agree with what we're saying, that's okay. You're free to disagree. But we're all believers. And, you know, and I just I don't want people coming in here trying to stir up trouble in saying that people aren't believers if we think about flat earth or we think about whether or not, you know, uh, hell is eternal versus annihilation. If we do talk about that and somebody takes the position of annihilation versus somebody takes the position of now, I can say I can see clearly in the scriptures that it's eternal torment, but they see clearly in the scriptures that it's annihilation. And if we get into that discussion, if we're all believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, even though hell is a biblical doctrine and the lake of fire is a biblical doctrine, people hold different views. And as long as someone's not attacking the deity of Christ and his soul sufficiency and what he's done and the simplicity of the gospel, they're a brother. Even if they disagree about the rapture and a bunch of other topics that are not salvific issues. And so we as believers sit there and have conversations respectful of one another about such matters. And so I hope you'll join us tomorrow night as we discuss and consider various topics that we believe will not only be of interest, but may 
help you come to your own conclusions because ultimately you have to make up your own mind about what you see in the word versus what we discuss, you know. So that's that's what we do. And that'll be tomorrow night on my channel for the most high Jesus. That's the number four, the most high Jesus. Uh, it's late night with Lisa and friends. It starts 8 p.m. Pacific, which is 11 p.m. Eastern. And I hope to see you there. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Sister Angel. Oh, I'm not muted. Okay, great. So uh, just to respond to uh, what was uh, being said in the chat, apparently, um, I'll, I'll just quickly recount my experience. So I, I, uh, I understand why some people are defensive about AA. Um, I'm torn on it because I do understand the, the, like where it came from. I think that ultimately the intent, at least by the creators of the program, which is what they call it, the program, um, was probably not good. <laughs> and I also see that, that like the, the danger of getting trapped and it, it, it's almost as if it's there to replace what should, you know, what should be a, like a yearning for the truth uh, of God's word um, with something that kind of uh, fulfills a lot of the things that uh, knowing the truth, it, you know, is really the only truth, you know, way to, way to fulfill or, or the way to, to fill that void, um, you know, actually believing the gospel and, and trusting God. But see, when I, when I went into, uh, uh, AA, it, like I said, it was because I was, uh, I was uh, addicted to uh, prescription painkillers. And this was the first time that I ever really, <laughs> I ever really learned about personal accountability. So um, in a way, I do think that God used this experience and even, uh, even the, the experience of going to AA, not just, you know, uh, uh, having to take, to get off this addictive substance, but just um, the experience of going to AA and, and some of the things that they have you do. I do think he used it for, for my good, which, you know, as Steve said, that's what he promised he would do. Um, so I understand when people are defensive about it. Cause I mean, there's some, there's some, uh, if, let's say like worldly positive, like, you know, benefits that can come from it. Um, but that's the same with anything. Uh, but, you know, I would rather somebody, uh, you know, die in a gutter from a heroin overdose uh, believing in the Lord Jesus than um, to get so, because, uh, I mean, I've seen I, people get really caught up in AA um, and, and in A. They, they, I mean, it becomes their life. It becomes their purpose. It becomes, uh, it makes, like, it's, it's how they know or they feel that they know they're on the right track and that they're, uh they're doing something with themselves and they're making a difference. And uh, it's, it's a deception because, you know, uh, the vast majority, especially now that we have Celebrate Recovery, a great deal of the people that uh, get stuck in the rooms, as they call it, uh, you know, they aren't believers um, because it's pretty hard for a, you know, a believer. Uh, you know, I guess I could see it, but someone that's really knowledgeable, at least about, about, you know, scripture to, to uh, conform to some of these tenets for, for any length of time because of the fact that, you know, it really is uh, not biblical in a lot of ways <laughs> to sit there and identify yourself as this sin, uh, not only, not only uh, while, you know, while you're struggling with it, but even decades after you overcome it. Um, but uh, I do think that, you know, like in my case, it, it did wonders in terms of actually making me uh, like face myself in a way that nobody had ever really made me do. My family, they were really bad when it came to disciplining me kind of like let me, cause I was, I was relatively like a good kid. So they just kind of were very hands off and it would have been really great if they had uh, uh, not overlooked that so much uh, when I was a kid because they, they made a real brat out of me and they, <laughs> they did a lot of, a lot more harm than, you know, I, obviously that they intended, they, they didn't intend to do any harm. They just thought that I was uh, sort of like, you know, on like autopilot as a kid, you know, because I didn't get into trouble and stuff. But the, the thing is, is you don't just discipline a kid because they get in trouble. You discipline a kid so they understand self-discipline so that they understand accountability. And I didn't have that um, because they just took for granted that I 
like like for the longest time, even though it was really obvious that I was sneaking painkillers out of my family's medicine cabinet. I mean, it was, should have been painfully obvious. They were just in denial about me doing something like that because I was so quote unquote good. Right. So that's how kind of like in denial they were in general. Um, and so for me, it benefited me to have to, to kind of in a structured way, uh, look at myself and consider certain things and, um, uh, you know, you just even focus on the idea of accountability. It was, it was uh, helpful, but at the end of the day, you know, I, I left the program because it definitely wasn't like, it wasn't really the answer in terms of like actually uh, overcoming addiction because it just sits there and makes you just wallow in it all the time. And in my opinion, this is just my opinion, but from some, some experience, uh, you know, this was a, a nine year struggle while I was really in the thick of it. Uh, the, the thing about addiction is it's really not the substance. It's your, it's your priorities. It's your priorities. The fact that, uh, you know, for the, for, you know, for the most part, you know, there are some, some things that people, they get so physically dependent on these substances that it doesn't really matter what their priorities are. It ends up overtaking them. But, uh, in my experience with most people, I noticed it was really the, the problem was they had no purpose and they had just entirely wrong priorities all about self gratification and stuff like that. And for me, when my priorities changed, that was when, uh, this, uh, like enslavement, just absolutely you know, mental enslavement to, um, trying to, you know, seek a, a certain type of like euphoria or, you know, uh, or something that made me like comfortable because I became used to it. Uh, you know, that, that's when I was kind of, uh, freed from that because I had, uh, had other priorities, I had other things that, that mattered more to me. And I did not, I don't feel like AA would have been conducive to that in the long run at all, because uh, you're just sitting there, uh, you, you know, it, if you go long enough, it, it becomes an addiction in and of itself. And, um, you know, there's a whole lot of bad people that frequent AA and look at it as hunting grounds for, uh, for victims. Um, and, uh, so, you know, uh, but I, I don't mean to offend anybody because I, I do see how, you know, with certain people, it really can, uh, serve a purpose. Um, but just remember that, uh, God can, God can use anything to, to serve, uh, uh, his purpose in your life. That doesn't necessarily make the thing in and of itself a good thing just because God used it. Just, you know, God is in the business of redeeming things and making the best out of a bad situation. But uh, just like, uh, you know, look at Rahab, kind of appropriate, right? Um, you know, in her situation, it's, it's kind of like you know, God used a harlot to bring, uh, to bring us Jesus. <laughs> and that doesn't mean that, you know, harlotry is a good thing, right? So just try to look at it that way. It's not meant to just, you know, not everybody in AA is evil at all, or, <laughs> it's, it, it, you know, God can use it. But um, other than that, I just, you know, had a really good time and uh, I, uh, I feel like, I guess I feel like it really went by really quickly, but, um, you know, and I, I'm looking forward to tomorrow night, which, uh, you know, Monarch Butterflies will be one of the topics uh, we discuss because there's just a lot of interesting things uh, that I've learned about Monarch Butterflies in raising Monarch Caterpillars sort of as a project to do with my kids. Um, you know, I've done this for a few years now and you, I just, you know, I feel like God has showed me a lot of really uh, incredible insights about specifically that type of butterfly that connect a lot of dot, dots about a lot of unexpected things. So uh, looking forward to that and I uh, just uh, love you guys. Um, and uh, thank you for uh, having me on the panel every Friday. It is very appreciated. So, And I'll just follow Steve's example. Thank you. <laughs> uh, wonderful. Well, you, you certainly got me interested in monarch butterflies and tomorrow night's uh, discussion. So I'm looking forward to hearing that. Um, but brother Stephen, uh, um, you you made some interesting comments in the chat room. Uh, I, I like what you said about I'm not against AA if Christ is your higher highest power, but uh, so go ahead, brother. Let's hear your uh, final remarks here. Um, yeah, uh, I uh, it's it's a very touchy subject, and I under uh, I really meant no ill will. I don't think any of us on here meant any ill will toward those 
that have gone through AA and have gotten victory through, through that. Um, because, and I want to point out that, you know, I really mean that, you know, if, if you get victory through that as a believer or not, whether, whether people created that with malevolent intent or not, I do see it does help people, but here's the lie. And the reason I have a problem with it, I don't know the creator's intention or any of that. Um, however, what I do think the lie that the devil would, would use is to make you think that you got victory on your own or through some other higher power than Christ. Cut is the only true victory that we can have is through Christ first for our salvation. And then as we walk with him and I do believe that whether they intended it or not this way, be, that the principles, the 12 steps are actually biblical. If you look at the book of uh, the, in Matthew, I believe it's chapter five, or maybe it's chapter eight. I'm not sure, but uh, the Beatitudes. And that's what Celebrate Recovery um, side uh, goes alongside with the 12 steps is the eight Beatitudes. And that those things are literally pertain directly to what the 12 steps have you do. But instead of saying, choose your own higher power, no, Christ is the only high power that will never fail you, will never leave you, will never forsake you. And so that is extremely important because we don't want people thinking that they are somehow getting free Free for what? What purpose are you getting free for? How? Because if all you do is get free of alcohol and you're still in, in, in bondage to the world and to sin because you're still under law and not under grace because you're not saved, then what freedom have you really found? So... You know, uh, th th that's important. The, the very first step in Celebrate Recovery is this, to step out of denial into God's grace, which is literally the gospel. To step out of denial would be repenting that, you're, that, that you change your mind. That's when you're in denial of something, you're ignoring the truth. So you repent and step out of denial and into God's grace through belief. That's the first step. You won't get any real true victory without that. So that's why AA it, it may not be a religion to some people. It is a religion. It all depends. So it all depends well, on your focus, purpose, and belief system going into it is whether it will help set you free or not. But, uh, that's you why know, the, recovery so much better because it is so yes. much more uh, yes. uh, biblical and, and, and direct. Absolutely. Whereas, that's why it can be very pernicious what the 12 steps in AA does because it takes God out of all of that, but kind of gives you these right. helpful mechanisms, uh, but right. just leaves the truth out and gives you no real uh, meaning at right. the end, except self-improvement. Right. 
which is right. a thing where with. you could be, because the, they'll tell you pick anything to you know I, I've I've heard it said some people a will doorknob. that are that are a Christian yeah a doorknob a chair your cat you know some people that lead them are believers and they will tell you my higher power is Christ I don't believe in any other higher power than that but if you are struggling with addiction to drugs or alcohol or anything. If you have a hurt, a hang up or a habit that describes everybody that's messing with your life and messing with your walk, I would recommend first be saved through faith and, uh, and, and find a celebrate recovery. Don't go to an AA Go to a celebrate recovery. If you have to, uh, through court order, to go to AA, ask the judge to give you, to to let you go to, to celebrate recovery instead. And pray that God allows it because I believe he will. Uh, there have been people who have done that and requested celebrate recovery or someone mentioned uh, something like teen challenge or uh a Christ centered recovery group or program. That's what you want. In my opinion, you want Christ as the center, God's grace as the center. And I don't know where I would be today. If it wasn't for a program like celebrate recovery that helped me get out of addiction. And, and so I, I, I mean, this accountability thing where people go wrong is they add law. No, it's all God's grace that when we tell each other our faults, it must be sheltered and covered in grace and that God can give you the victory. He gives you the victory. You know, the fact that you're telling somebody what you're going through, what you struggle with is, is proof that right now, as you tell me, you struggle with gambling or uh, smoking or pornography or thoughts of violence or whatever, that as you're telling me that, you are not doing it. So, you know, that's and that and to know that you are loved God's grace covers you despite those failings, despite that, that that sin has been already washed away. That's how it should be addressed, in my opinion. If you add law where, oh, you better stop doing that. No. When I had an accountability partner and it was very helpful, one of the closest friends I've ever had because of that, because we knew each other in in such a deep way that we also knew that it was there was there was this thing called uh love from one brother to another that was unconditional that represented to each other the love of Christ knowing what, when, you know, that's the thing. Like when you, even if you sit down and do a spiritual inventory of your life and write down everything you've done wrong, all the stuff, whether you tell it to somebody or not, and can look at that and say, I'm a wretch of a person, but yet God still loves me. That's power to overcome because God's grace is sufficient when you understand how much he loves you, that he died for a wretch like you and me. That's amazing. That's what sets people free. That's what helps them get victory, not law. So that's important. And that's why <laughs> if you do have a struggle, go to a celebrate recovery, not an AA. If you have to by law, because that's what you were 
mandated to by the courts in the U S or wherever you live, see if you can find the salary recovery and go to that. If you can't get out of going to AA or ask the judge and pray to the judge of the universe that he would allow you to go to a celebrate recovery instead. So thank you. I know I went a little long there, but I'm sorry. I thought that was very important. I don't judge anybody going to AA. I pray that you get victory, but I would find a celebrate recovery where you can go and get the same type of teaching with Christ at the center, with God's grace at the center. So thank you. Right. I think our fear is mainly for the unbeliever, especially that gets ensnared in the age more than the, uh, the, like somebody that, you know, is already a believer and they're just trying to use it as like a, a secondary yeah. thing. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and for the unbeliever, look up the statistics of those who've gone through AA and those who've gone through cell re- recovery about those who, or any Christ centered recovery group, look up the statistics about those who have returned back and, and not stayed in victory and had to go back again versus those who, who went through a Christ center recovery group. And I think the statistics will shock you. It's something like 10 to 20% return back to their addiction. If they go through AA or NA, if they go through a Christ centered recovery group, like celebrate recovery or team challenge, it's something like 75 to 85% that don't return back to their addiction. So Hey guys, can I interject something real quick? Absolutely. Uh, okay. Um, Michael McGregor pointed this out. I forgot all about that, that they adjourned their meetings with a prayer. Now, the prayer they adjourned the meetings with yep. is the serenity prayer. Now, watch this now. They edited the serenity prayer. They removed the name of Jesus. <laughs> this is what I try to say. This is why it's a religion. People don't understand. They, they think because oh, maybe, yes. you know... It, it's stylized after religion. This is why people go. And it, I don't understand why people one. can't understand that. Okay. The full one is the best. We do the okay. full one at Celebrate Recovery, just so you know. We do All the right. Full I'm going to read the full one so y'all can see. Yes. Okay. This is the portion oh, that they say. I love it. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. We've all heard that, and we thought that was the whole prayer. That's nope. not the whole prayer. Living the next one is, day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, but trusting that you will make all things right in the end. Wow. Yeah, but that ain't even the end of it. Okay. Go ahead. Because there was there was one it was written in 1872 because it's been changed. Okay. So then it says living one day at a time, accepting the hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful yes. world as it is. Not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to oh, your will. If I surrender to your will. Yes, I forgot so that So that I may be reasonably happy in this in life this and life, supremely, supremely happy. happy with you in the next. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, that was that was what I said was off of memory totally. Yep. That's the that's full the, prayer. That's, that's, that's the, the gospel. Serenity, really. That's the gospel yes. and your walk combined. That's 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 living in what does Paul call it? Um, uh, contentment. That that uh, you know uh, he strives with in all things, whether it's good or bad. That that I live to be content in all things. Okay. Lisa, have you heard of Celebrate okay. Recovery? I'm sure you have. I appreciate that. I'm sorry, have I heard of what, sister? Celebrate Recovery. No. Sorry, I haven't. You haven't heard of it? Okay. No. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Th- th- that was something even several years ago. Uh, I-, I guess it was kind of new when I-, I-, I went to it a couple times instead of the AA meetings. And um, 
and I wasn't a believer then. But uh, as far as I know, Steve, people can use it interchangeably because a lot of the people that I was in the uh, the rehab with that, that were, I was the only one that wasn't court ordered there. I was there voluntarily. Um, they were going to to them interchangeably. Uh, <coughs> but um, all right, well, that was very enlightening. I had no idea that there was a, an original prayer that had been changed. Um, all right, Brother Ben, let's get your uh, final remarks. Uh, I just really enjoyed the experience and fellowship tonight, and I will see you to tomorrow on Lisa's program. Hmm, okay. All right, Brother Ben, that was uh, uh, succinct. Thank you. Um, well, it seems like we have uh, some people who have a lot of direct personal experience with AA and, and uh, uh, the, you know these programs. These uh, and so you have um, obviously with that personal experience. There's a lot to be learned from that. Um, I did have some personal experience, not as an addict or an alcoholic myself. But uh, fa I have family members who are alcoholics or were alcoholics and uh, drug addicts. And, um, it got, I got uh, involved in, it in another way at one point where um, I used to invest in a lot of real estate. So I, I bought a house uh, and for the purpose of turning it into a, what's called a sober house where you can. Yeah, have, sober living. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I attempted to uh, uh, conduct it and to help them uh, get off of their addictions and 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 also, but also uh, lead them to Christ. And it was the hardest thing I've ever done. It was a disaster for me. It was, uh, you know, it, I, I think out of all the men that were went through that program, um, dozens at least, uh, that lived in that house, and I tried to help uh, only one of them that I'm uh, I'm aware of. Actually, I think really got his life uh, turned around. The rest of it was just completely uh, not only uh, it, it didn't work to help them, I, uh, although I certainly tried. But it just it cost me just a lot of frustration and and uh, grief and, and and money. So it was. Um, but that's been my experience with it. But I, I do think the AA has been successful to, to help some people with, with uh, their addictions. But really, uh, it may, it maybe it's a place to go for that. But, but it's not the place to go if you want the answer to the ultimate problem, which, which is, you know, what happens after you die. <laughs> so uh, that's where they, they've missed the boat because we cannot have a doorknob as, as our higher power uh, and, and go to heaven, you know, but in a, in, you can, you can, you can make anything your higher power. There is no uh, guidance or rules about that. So uh, yeah, there's only one higher power truly. And there's only one higher power that can give you eternal life. So um, the discussion tonight was, uh, you know, a lot of great uh, answers. Uh, and uh, some of the questions were a little bit, um, uh, I think, deeper than some of the other questions that we've been answering. So it did require a little more time to answer some of the questions, but I, I enjoyed it very much. So don't forget to join uh, Sister Lisa's program tomorrow night. And then uh, on Sunday, we have our regular Sunday church service on this same channel here at Church of the Eternally Secure. That begins at 5 p.m. Eastern time. So please join us for that. Thank you, everybody on the panel and everybody in the chat room. You are the congregation. Uh, it's it's wonderful to see what is happening in the, the, the chat rooms. Uh, uh, it's getting better and better and better uh, as far as uh, everybody understanding how it, sh it sh they c should be conducting themselves. And, and, and I'm seeing more and more direct participation from the chat room really get in, being involved in in the, the panel's discussion. And that's what, that's what we've been hoping for. So thank you again, everybody, for participating tonight. Bless you. Oh, I forgot. Hendrix wanted me to say something. Uh, well, Hendrix, uh, 
I guess the only thing I can tell you is that uh, uh, my, my first wife, uh, I've talked about how she was a Spanish and Cuban, and that's how I, I learned a lot of Spanish. But I've had very uh, bad, I don't want to say luck, but uh, problems with marriage. My, my first wife died from food poisoning. And then my second wife died from a, a, a broken neck. And, and that's because she wouldn't eat the food. <laughs> that's uh, all right, Hendricks. I hope that's uh, served the purpose. So you wanted uh, uh, some humor at the end. <laughs> so now you <laughs> the final salutation. Thank you, everybody. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior, God, Jesus. <laughs>